Hi again all. Welcome to session number four of GG497 Geological Visualization. Today we're going to be looking at dipping strata. We looked at horizontal rocks and vertical rocks last week and this week we're going to look at ones which have some sort of angle of dip, some inclination. Today we're going to cover structural contours and show them how they can be made using maps and then using structural contours to in turn make interpretations about maps and then we'll show how we can use structural contours to make cross sections for dipping rocks okay hopefully you guys remember that we've been talking about contours in terms of topography and contours are just lines on a map that join points of equal height. That's what a topographic contour is. So you can imagine on our block diagram all of those lines that we can see on the top surface of the block diagram they're joining points of equal height above sea level and if we were to look at that the top of that block diagram in in map view then this is the sort of map that we'd we generate. This would be our map view and these red lines they'd be our contours joining points of equal height above sea level. So if you think about it, all a contour does, all the topographic contour does, is show you how height is varying along a surface. Right? So why then can't we draw some contours for other surfaces? Let's imagine that we have these two sedimentary beds, A and B. And between them, there's a boundary, there's a bedding plane. And let's call that surface AB, that, that plane that separates A from B. Let's imagine that then we could lift off that rock unit A. We could just like scoop it off the surface to expose that plane. Let's take A and remove it from the surface. Let's just lift it off so we can no longer see it. Now we're looking at that surface, that contact AB, that plane that separates rock unit A from rock unit B. Now hopefully you guys can see that this plane, this AB plane, it has a dip to it. It's kind of, it's dipping down towards us in effect. It's high over here and it's low over here and it's sort of dipping down in this direction. Okay? And because it's dipping, the height along that surface will not be the same everywhere. Like if you were to be sat on it, you'd be higher up than if you were to be sat down here. Okay? So for example, the up dip surface will be higher. It'll be higher above a sea level or whatever datum we use. And the, and the part of the surface that's down dip that's closer to us will be lower down. So maybe what we could do then is draw lines across this dipping surface of equal height. We can draw contours. So for example, if we were on this dipping surface and we walked along it in a horizontal line along this, we'd always stay at 150 meters above sea level. That line along that surface AB would connect all of the points along that surface where the height is 150. Okay, it's just like a contour. Because we're drawing contours on a structure, in this case a, a bedding surface, we call this type of contour, we call them structural contours. Okay, so you can imagine we could take those structural contours, we could look at them in map view, in, um, sorry, in block diagram view, in three dimensions. And if we took a top down view of that surface, we could see our structural contours in map view. Yep. And that map would show us the height of that plane, that contact AB in, in two dimensional space. Now structural contours are handy for, for one uh, reason and that's they can tell you about the orientation and dip of the plane or the feature that you've drawn structural contours for. Hopefully you guys will remember 
that an inclined surface, a, a bedding plane or a, a fault plane or a unconformity, they will have three components. The first component is the strike and that's the orientation at which you can draw a horizontal line along that plane. If you have an inclined surface, there's infinite numbers of lines that you could draw over that surface, but there's only ever going to be one orientation where you can make a perfectly horizontal line, a line where the height of that line doesn't change. The second feature or geometric feature that a um, planar surface has is the dip, and that's simply the angle between the horizontal and the dipping surface. Okay, that maximum angle from the horizontal down to the dipping surface. And then the dip direction will be the compass orientation, the bearing in the direction of that dip. Okay, and an easy way to check whether or not you've measured the dip direction correctly is that the dip direction is always 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 perpendicular to strike okay so those are our those are our three um, components dip is the angle of tilt and this angle of dip is the same as this angle of dip here the strike is a horizontal line along that inclined surface and the direction of dip is perpendicular to strike and it measures the compass bearing in the direction of dip Dip can only vary from 0 to 90. It can either be horizontal, vertical, or somewhere in between. And the strike, because it's a compass orientation, like it's a direction on a map, it varies from 0 to 360. And similarly, because dip direction is a bearing, it's a direction on a map, that too varies from 0 to 360. And it is always perpendicular from strike. Okay, that's a refresher of um, the structural features of inclined planes. And then let's go back to our geological contact AB. This is our map view showing the structural contours for um, that geological contact. And now we're going to figure out how we can use these structural contour maps or the structural contours in map view to figure out those three components of inclined planes that we just um, refreshed ourselves about. So the first one, how can we use these structural contour maps to figure out the direction of strike? Well, a key thing to remember is that the strike of a contact is the horizontal line along that plane. Okay? And if you think about it, each one of these structural contours is a horizontal line. It's, con it's linking points of constant height above sea level or above whatever datum. So everywhere along this line, for example, every point along that line, the height of the plane is 140 meters above sea level, say. Okay, so by definition, each one of these structural contours is a horizontal line. Therefore, you can simply measure the orientation of these structural contours and they will give you the orientation of strike. So strike, take home point, strike is the same orientation as the structural contours. So if your map has a north arrow on it, we can measure clockwise from north, that angle between the north arrow and our structural contour. When we do that in this example, we get an angle of 65 degrees, which because it's a direction, we give us a three figure number, zero, six, five. Because a strike for, for some people, um, it, it can have two directions. If it's striking 065, then it, it's striking 180 degrees the other way, so 245. There are such things as the right hand rule, um, and whether or not you agree with that as the, as the best method to learn these things is, is up to you. But if you want to call strike a, a, a two 
number reference then, then I don't really have a massive problem with it. Okay, next question then. What is the direction of dip of the contact AB? If you think about that for a second. Well, we just realized or remembered that dip direction is always perpendicular to strike. So if we've got our strike line as being parallel to our ground contours, then the dip direction is going to be 90 degrees to it, right? It's going to be in this direction that I'm, that in, uh, potentially in this orientation that I'm moving my mouse. So to figure out whether or not that plane is dipping in this direction or in that direction, we have to look at the actual numbers on our structural contours. And we can see that we're on the 150 here, 140 here, 130 and 120 down here. So we chain, we're, we're, we're going downhill, we're going down dip in this direction, aren't we? So the only dip direction that works for this structural contour map is in this direction. So to summarize that, dip direction is always perpendicular to the structural contours, because the structural contours are parallel to strike, and the direction of dip is always going from the higher values on the structural contours to the lower values of the structural contours. So in this case, our dip direction would be 155, or southeast. And then the last component of our plane that we can measure from structural contours is the angle of dip. How steep is this plane? Now we can't just directly measure this, we can't slap our compass on a structural contour map, we have to do a little bit of maths. And what we need to do is find two points on that plane on the structural contours. So for instance I've taken a point uh, here for 150 and then I've gone down dip along the dip direction to another point on the structural contour, this one's at 130. What we can then do is draw a little triangle where this yellow line is the surface AB, so we're kind of looking at it in cross section. Here we are at 150 there, and here we are at 130 there. That gives us a vertical distance change of 20 meters and a horizontal distance change of whatever our map scale is. Okay? So once we have our vertical distance change and once we've calculated our horizontal distance change using our map scale, we can then work out that the tangent of this angle X, which is the dip, is equal to the vertical distance divided by the horizontal distance. Once we have that ratio, we can take the inverse tangent of it and that will give us the angle of dip in degrees. Okay, so maybe just um, practice this in the lab a couple of times just so you know what the mathematical orientation is. Okay, let me now ask you guys a question. If we were to look at this block diagram, and let's imagine that this block diagram is our entire universe at the moment, and we're currently self-isolated at home in here. If this is our entire universe, which formation will crop out in the area? A or B or A and B? Well, if you look at the map, A is the only formation that's ever going to crop out in this area, right? It'll only ever be formation A. The reason that B never crops out in this area is that the contact between A and B, it's always lower down than the ground. Its height is always less than the ground itself. Or in other words, the structural contours of that plane AB, they're always, always less than the ground contours. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. For, for A and B to crop out on the surface, the structural contours for that plane AB, they must exceed the ground contours in order for it to get to the surface. 
Okay, in this example, we've changed it slightly. Here we have two different rock types. We've got uh, rock unit A and rock unit B. And then we've got this plane between them. And in this instance, you can see that the contact actually reaches the surface. Okay, it breaches the surface and consequently we have exposures of rock unit A and exposures of rock unit B. Okay, if we think about mathematically, what we can say is that in this region, this part of our map, the contact between A and B is always lower than the ground. Like if we were stood here, then we'd have to drill down to find the contact A and B. If we were stood over here, we'd have to drill down to get it. If we were stood over here, we'd have to drill down to get it. In this region, where B is exposed, the contact is always, always lower than the ground. In other words, the height of the contact is less than the height of the ground. In this region though, the height of the contact because it's dipping in this direction, it's actually hit it's it, it's hit the ground and then it's continued up into the air. So wherever we are on this side of the contact, the contact is always higher than the height of the ground. It will be up in the air. It, we, we'd probably see it before erosion had taken it away. But currently that contact is projecting above the ground somewhere. So mathematically, the height of the contact is always greater than the height of the ground. So, if the height of the ground is higher than the height of the contact here, and the height of the ground is lower than the height of the contact in this region, then how would you express the mathematical relationship along the contact? Like that point on the earth where you can see that contact, where you can put one foot on B and one foot on A. Mathematically, how would you express that? Well, the mathematical expression for that contact along, for, for that plane along the contact that you see on the map is telling you that the height of the contact along that line is equal to the height of the ground. Okay, if we want to look at that in cross section view, we can kind of summarize that. Over here, the height of the contact is always less than the height of the ground. You'd have to drill down into it. And ho over here, the height of the contact is up in the air somewhere. The height of the contact is always greater than the height of the ground. But along that outcrop of the contact, that's where the height of the contact equals the height of the ground. Okay, if you want to replay those slides a little bit, I completely understand, but I just, just want you to take away that wherever you see a contact on the surface, the height of that contact is equal to the height of the ground. For some people it will be blindingly obvious, but for others it may need to, to replay some of those slides. Okay, so if you were to draw contoured surfaces for these things, this is the sort of thing you might end up with. These curvilinear um, contours are the topography, they're the ground surface. And these red ones are our structural contours. And hopefully you can see that our structural contours, say our 201 here, it intersects the 201 at the contact for the ground surface. Okay, so how are these structural contour maps made? In order to make these, we um, could use some sort of subsurface information on the depths of, of rocks and then figure out if it's if it's a depth Y over there and depth X over there, we could figure out what the gradient between them is. And maybe we can get some of that information remotely through geophysics. Maybe we could estimate it from the information that we've collected from geological mapping. And maybe we could um, figure it out using directly sampled data through drilling, through making boreholes down into the crust to find out where rocks are at depth. And maybe we could otherwise calculate it using trigonometry. And we'll go through these later methods next week. 
But maybe what we could do first of all is um, have a, a cool example of how we could do it using seismic. And essentially what seismic imaging requires is a, a release of energy from the surface. So maybe an explosion or maybe one of these cool vibrating trucks that sort of bounces up and down that releases energy down into the crust as it passes through the crust when it intersects a media of different density some of that seismic energy will be reflected back and the time it takes for that seismic energy to to leave the source hit the reflector and bounce back when you get multiple signals from an individual reflector that does that you can figure out the 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 depth and angle of the reflector of, of our change in bedding maybe we could do it that way Or maybe what we could actually do is construct a set of structural contours from a geological map itself. Maybe we could start with a geological map and then use where those rocks crop out on a geological map to build one of these sets of structural contours for a dipping surface. So let's spend some time doing that. And let's start by remembering that wherever we see the contacted surface, the height of the contact is the same as the height of the ground at that point. Okay, let's remember that. Let's write that down before we tackle the next few slides because we're going to try and do these together as much as that's possible remotely. Okay, so once we've got that written down, let's go and have a look at some schematic maps to see how we might start drawing structural contours. Okay, so this is a map view where we've got um, two units, rock type A and rock type B. And this is the contact between those two units. This is the plane AB. What we've also got are these red lines, which are our topographic contours, our ground heights. And we're going to use this map, no other information, to start drawing some structural contours for that contact between A and B. Now, what we need to do is find places along that contact where we know with absolute certainty what the height is. We can give the height a numerical value. Have a think about where, if there are any points along that contact where you know for certain what the height of the contact is. Well, if you think about it, along this topographic line, we know that everywhere along that topographic contour, the height is 60, let's say 60 meters above sea level. And where our contact between A and B intersects that contour, by definition, we know the height of the contact between A and B at those points. So right here, the contact between A and B hits the 60 meter topographic contour. So at that point, the height of the contact must also be 60 meters. It does the same thing there, and it does the same thing there. So then what we could do is draw a line which connects all of those points along that, that triplet that we've got there. And that can serve as our 60 meter structural contour. So everywhere above, uh, sorry, everywhere along this line, that's where the contact between A and B would be 60 meters. Okay, that's one line. But in order to start building a, a plane or to see this in three dimensions, we need another line. We need uh, 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 another um, structural contour to tell us which way this, um, this contact is dipping. Yep. So is there anywhere else on this map that we can see the exact height of this contact A and B? Well, here and here, we know that the contact between A and B intersects the 70 meter topographic contour. So at this point and this point, we know that ground, the ground height is 70 and the contact height is 70 because they intersect at the same place. 
So then what we can do is draw our second structural contour that shows everywhere along which the height of the contact between A and B is 70 meters above sea level. Now we haven't got any other structural contours. We can't, we can't find any other specific heights. We haven't got any more um, topography lines that intersect our contact. But maybe what we could do if we were feeling fairly certain, we could extrapolate where the 50 meter contact would be. If we're on the 70 meter contact here and we're at the 60 meter contour there, if this plane is dipping at a constant angle, then we could interpret where the 50 meter structural contour would be. It would be that because it's a, it's a 10 meter interval from 70 to 60 and then 60 to 50, that spacing between the 70 and 60 meter structural contour would be the same as the spacing between the 60 and 50 meter structural contour. Okay, we could continue this indefinitely either side of our map to give us our 80 and our 40. But you can see now that we've got these three structural contours which would allow us to figure out the direction of strike of the of the contact, the direction of dip from high to low of the contact, from high to low. And if we had a scale, then maybe what we could do is figure out with some uh, rudimentary trigonometry the angle of dip of that plane. Okay, so that was a, quite a nice example where we can where we can basically just join the dots. But what if we had this sort of example where we've got another contact between two different rock types between C and D. This is our contact as it moves across the, the ground surface. And we can see where it intersects the topography in discrete points, but we haven't got anywhere where it intersects the same ground contour twice. How might we do that? Take a few seconds, maybe pause the video to see if you can think of a way uh, through this problem. Okay, well if you've thought about that, maybe you've come to the um, answer, but let's um, Let's do it together. The first step in a situation like this is to know all of the points where you can um, define precisely what the height of the contact is. So here the height of the contact must be 100, 140 because it crosses the 140 topographic contour. Here it's 120 and here it's 100. Now between this point here at 100 and this point here at 140, you know that that plane must get through 120 meters. There's no way that you can go from a 140 meter contour to a 100 meter contour without going through the 120. So we must, somewhere between these two points, we must cross the 120. Now if we're going to assume, and sometimes we don't, we shouldn't always assume, but if we're going to assume that this plane is, um, it has a uniform dip along it, then the point at which that plane hits 120 is going to be halfway between 100 and 140. So whatever this distance between 140 and 110 is, we just half it and then mark on where this plane would hit the 120 structural contour. Now what we can do is draw a tie line, with, uh, an interpreted and inferred structural contour that says that everywhere along this line the height of the contact between our two rock types, between the blue rock and the green rock, is going to be 120. Once we've anchored ourselves with one of these structural contours, we can then infer the orientation of the others. And again, if our um, plane is uniformly dipping, then each one of these structural contours is going to be parallel to each other. So once we've got one in, 
we can then infer the positions of the others. I mean that's all well and good but at this point you're probably asking me well if I've already got a geological map why am I bothering drawing structural contours? What is the point? I've already finished the map. Well imagine that you've been able to, you're working in an area like this where largely you've got very limited exposure. There's a couple of um, crags out in the distance but the rest of the place everything is covered um, by drift uh, deposits. You can't see any real rocks. Well what you could actually do then is use a structural contour map that you've been able to use uh, or able to produce from an area that does have a bit of exposure and use that to interpret where the geology would be in areas of poor exposure. Okay, so let's see how we might do that with an example. Okay, this is another map view. And this set of structural contours shows you the dip and strike, or shows you the structural contours of a plane between sandstone and an overlying shale. So we've got the sedimentary contact the plane of which we've represented with these structural contours. Again, just as an aside, our strike is going to be parallel to the structural contours and our dip direction is going to go from high to low, perpendicular to those contours. Okay, then what we're going to do is overlay our topography, our topographic contours, our red lines onto our structural contour map. Now you guys remember from the previous slides that wherever the height of the contact equals the height of the ground, that's where we should see the contact on the surface. That's where the contact between the sandstone and the overlying shale, that's where it'll crop out on the map. So what we need to do is find everywhere where our structural contours equal the height of our ground contours. So we've got one here, there, um, the height of the ground is 140 and the height of the plane is 140. So at that point where they intersect, that's where the contact would crop out on the ground surface. Where else can we find it? Well we've got 120, 120, we've got 100, 100 the 80 and the 80 they don't intersect so it's not going to hit there it hits our 100 our 120 our 140 again so we've marked everywhere that the height of the contact equals the height of the ground so we've got these series of points and then you guys have probably guessed it in order to work out the run of the contact we simply join up these points where each one of them is an intersection between the topographic contour and our structural contour. So here we're at 140, we can join up to our 120, we can join up to our 100. At this point, we can't just continue up to our 80 because if you look back at the map, our 80 topographic contour does not intersect our 80 ground height. So because there's no intersection, then our stratigraphic contact between our two rock types, it cannot progress that way. Instead, the run of the contact must turn to join up with the other intersections of our structural contours and topographic contours. Okay, I've just continued it out this way because, you know, I, you know the PowerPoint and I didn't have a 160 um, topographic line. Okay, so here we've got our contact between our two rock units, between our sandstone and our overlying shale. Great, so this is the boundary between our rock units, but now we need to ask ourselves, okay, which side of the boundary would our sandstone be and which side of the boundary would our shale be?
take a minute to think about that. This is our contact. So we know that there is sandstone and shale either side of it, but which side is which? Okay, well, you can think about it this way. This is the way that, that makes most sense to me. If we were to take two points either side of the um, contact, let's start with this one. Here, the ground height is about 90-ish. We're halfway between the 100 and the 80 topographic contour. But the height of the contact is 80. So here, the height of the ground is higher than the, um, the the height of the ground is higher than the height of the contact. Over here, the height of the contact is 160, and the height of the ground is somewhere between 140 here and wherever 160 would be over here. So here, the height of the contact is higher than the height of the ground. So if we were to draw just a schematic cross section through that, over here at our blue cross, the height of the contact is higher than the height of the ground. And over here at our green dot, the height of the contact is lower than the height of the ground. So for our purposes, where we've got this stratigraphic relationship between a sandstone and an overlying shale, then the only way that could work in our schematic cross section is if this side is our sandstone and this side is our shale. So once we figure that out, once we've got the um, uh, understanding of, of our outcrop contact, and we know which side of the outcrop both of our units are, are cropping out, we can then finish our map showing the distribution of our two rock types. Now, if you want to replay that a, a few times, that's fine. The, the, one of the things about um, this geological visualization is if you've, uh, if you've got a predisposition to think about things in three dimensions, you probably pick this up quite quickly. But if you haven't, then that's why we record these things for you, so you can take your time with it and get in touch with me otherwise. Now, briefly, what I want to show you um, as, we, as we finish is how we can use these structural contours to help build a cross section, like an actual one, not just this sort of, you know, handy little thought experiment um, conceptual model, how we actually use them to build a real cross section. So let's take this example. This is a, a rudimentary geological map. We've got two rock units. We've got this B, and then we've got this A, and we've got some red topographic contours. We don't have any dips and strikes, so we can't just use an angle from the map and draw it on our cross section. So instead, we're going to have to figure out what the dip is using structural contours. So what we need to do is find specific points where we know the height of the contact. For example, here and here, the contact on our map, the geological contact, intersects the 120 structural contour. Uh, sorry, it intersects the 120 topographic contour. So we can link those two points and draw ourselves a 120 meter structural contour for the contact. Here and here, it intersects the 110 topographic contour. And here and here, it intersects the 100 topographic contour. So we've got this set of structural contours which we can then use to build us a cross section. Okay, so just like we did in the previous examples uh, from previous weeks, we'd use our strip of paper, and in red, I have marked on um, the points at which you the cross section crosses um, uh, topographic contours. So this topographic contour here is 120, and it intersects the cross section there. This topographic contour is 110, 
and it intersects our cross section there. And then what I've also marked on is all of the points at which I know the height of the contact between A and B. I know the height of the contact A and B is whatever the ground height is. I know that the height of the contact between A and B there is 110 because that's where the structural contour intersects our cross section. I know that the height of the contact there is, sorry, this is 110, that's 120. And I know that height of the structural contour there is 100 because that's where our 100 structural contour intersects our cross section. So then what I can do is use the red markings to, to draw a rudimentary hill profile. And then what I can do is use the black markings where I've intersected the contact at the ground surface, the contact at the 120 structural contour, 110 structural contour, and 100 structural contour. And by linking them together, I can finish the cross section. Okay, we'll go through a lab um, now, lab number four, where we look at inclined strata, um, how we build structural contours and how we can use those to make cross sections. So at this point, if you want to turn to lab number four, we can put some of that into practice. Okay, thanks for listening. See you next week where we look at inclined strata on real geological maps.